I party my way through uni, spewing to gutters most weekends. Um, and it took me six or seven years to do a three year degree. Wow. Just because I couldn't find what I liked and I kept changing. Because so they kept threatening to kick me out because I kept failing subjects. Right. So every time yeah, I'd jump to a new university, new degree, and go again. But eventually I, I figured out how to game the system. So we're joined by William Wang today, founder and CEO of Growth Labs. Before starting his own company, Will was working in corporate IT as a business and data analyst while freelancing as a copywriter on the side. In 2017, Growth Labs was officially founded and fast forward to now, Will has helped B2B SaaS tech and fintech companies grow exponentially. Growing up in Maryland and now based in Brookvale, Manly area, Will spends his free time surfing, diving and swimming. Welcome to Level Asian. <laughs> Thank you. I think um, you probably took some of that from my LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the timelines are a little bit yeah. <laughs> LinkedIn. We couldn't find any dirt on you. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good. My team are doing a good job. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, you're cleaning up your digital footprint. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, like, we can't right. find yeah, anything on this guy. Those photos from Buggy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't add anyone on your Facebook. We're not Facebook friends. Uh, uh, cool. So tell us a bit about your upbringing. Like, like I said, we don't have any dirt on you, so we don't know anything. <laughs> um, man, upbringing. I mean, I guess it's like the typical immigrant story. Mm. Um, I came to Australia when I was two or three, like so super young. Um, so you weren't born here? No, I wasn't born here. He would like, yeah, I was three when I when he came over, I think. Um, and then just grew up in Cabramatta. So um, for those you know, listening who are like, oh, it's Cabramatta. It's like, it was really, really rough when we were growing up. Um, government housing, all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, you know, like bottom of the barrel in terms of society, surrounded by like drug dealers and junkies and all that kind of yeah. stuff. And then, um, yeah, so it was like pretty, pretty interesting, let's just mm-hmm. say, in terms of upbringing. Um, the dad came from China because it was like, man, this, you know, he had all these grand visions, aspirations for what he wanted to do. But the Communist Party was like, no, nah, here's what you're actually doing. <laughs> He's like, yeah, stuff. You're like, can we swear here? <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah, 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 yeah. you can like, do whatever. Like, there, so I'm getting that here. So um, came over here and then like we followed shortly after. But it was like, yeah, it was pretty tough. Like he worked three jobs or something like that when we were younger. My mum worked like two factory jobs. And so we were just running around the neighborhood, like running a mark or that kind of stuff. Um, ended up moving to Maryland because like, Maryland was a nice area at that time. Not really anymore. Um, the year we moved out of Maryland, there was like two shootings in our street. And my parents were just like, yeah, time to go. So, um, but, you know, yeah, it was like interesting childhood. Um, yeah. Kind of very typical of the, the immigrant story, I guess. And yeah, so I kind of did that. Um, I think in a way it was kind of formative in like building the hunger and ambition. Um, and I think it really lit a fire. And I mean, like, all right, I've seen this side of things. Let me go see this other side. So I guess that's where it kind of led me to you know, the career and stuff like that. And um, like, I was never satisfied with the career. And I just like, I, I don't want to do this. Um, and then that plus the ambition from growing up like dirt broke was just like all right let's just try this entrepreneur thing so i guess it's like a 30 something year journey compressed in two minute segment but <laughs> like i'm pretty sure it's a pretty typical or you know pretty common story um with, with agents not just in australia but like kind of everywhere right yeah well on your website it said <laughs> <laughs> that you went from corporate it into what um owning a business but that transition happened because I think it was a family business. You couldn't find any good marketing agencies. Um, so the on the long official story of how that happened, like the website's the best part. Like it's yeah. the highlight, <laughs> the highlight right? reel, right? Like, oh, I'm super professional and awesome, but it wasn't like that. Um, so my my wife's family are very entrepreneurial. Mm-hmm. Um, her dad has had like, you know, furniture businesses, um, uh, heaps of trade businesses, and now they run like very successful uh, kitchen renovation business, uh, stone masonry business. So I got to cut my teeth in some of the marketing they were doing. And that's what helped me to at least have a company to practice the marketing stuff on. Um, in terms of the corporate stuff though, like I was in corporate IT, had nothing to do with marketing, mm-hmm. but I just really hated it. And um, the thing that really got me to to leave or, or to, to jump out of it was um, I joined this company like this big Japanese company, right? And they've got this <coughs> consulting arm. Uh, and I went into them, uh, I think I started in November, the year before I actually quit my job. And because I was new in Australia, like they like you taking leave over Christmas, but I actually figured out the system where I actually love working over Christmas because everything's so chill, nothing happened. So like kind of cruising and watching YouTube at work. I am the same. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I worked it out. Like our agents are pretty smart sometimes working shit out like that. Um, so, but that happened. They're like, look, cause you're new, you have to take all your leave. It's not paid. 
I was like, cool, that's that's fine. I'll take a hit for the company, but just know that you know it might come in place because my wife was like pregnant at that time with my youngest, um, my youngest kid. So I was like, look, later on, I do want to take a little bit of extra time off, and I'm you don't even have to pay me time without pay, but I just want you know if I'm going to do this for you, can you do this for me? And they're like, yeah, yeah, of course, everything's cool. Um, and so fast forward that job, you know, like Monday to Friday, literally I've be flying from Sydney to Melbourne away from the family because the head office was in Melbourne. Um, we were Sydney based. So I had to go over there because I was working with data and stuff like that. So I needed to be around, around heads of heads of departments. And like, it was starting to wear me out. My son was just born. I was flying constantly. It was like getting pretty tough. And so on um, July ish, the following year, I think um, we wanted to take a family trip to just like reconnect and spend more time together. Mm-hmm. And I only had uh, one week of, paid leave and so i said look i just want to take a week and a half just an extra two three days i did that for you you know took leave in november can you just reciprocate and give me some extra paid days without leave and so that went up the chain to japan and you know but being counter in japan was like this guy's really taking a lot of like leave even though it's not paid no disapproved and just wouldn't give me the leave wow and so that combined with how much i was traveling how much i was missing of you know my son growing up and i was just like that's it that's enough um and and i I made it blindly for faith and i just said look i'm gonna leave i'm gonna try to figure this on the way down and if it doesn't work i can always go back to work later on so Mm. that was kind of the the whole experience of you know what made me actually decide um and what kind of pushed me to the point where like look like i just got to do this so was that what like was that like a clean, like I'm not working anymore in corporate and then moved into doing your business? Was there like a uh, transition, like a phase in between? Yeah, I mean, so on top of that, like I wasn't stupid enough to just go like, fuck this, Fuck it. My wife's not working anymore. No income. Let's just do it. Uh, I wasn't that dumb. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> I've made some really dumb decisions, but uh, at the time as well, like I was networking, I was meeting local businesses, trying to sell them, you know, social media marketing and this kind of stuff um, on the side as a side hustle. And there's a local newspaper to me that had a whole bunch of clients on um, advertising the newspaper. And he was like, oh, we don't do social media stuff. If you come and do it, I'll walk you into every single one of my clients and we'll crush it. Like, we'll blow this up. You'd be making like 400K a year. And I was like, oh, yeah, 400K sick. And he was like, yeah, yeah, we'll do all this, all of that. And he's like, just quit, just quit. Just trust me, bro, just quit. I'm like, all right, all right, let's do this. <laughs> Went to work for him, um, oh, with, with him. But now looking back, it's more like for, for this guy. Mm. Um, you know, he's like, all right, cool. Let's go and talk to this business. Who's been my client for like a year or something, like long-term client. I'm like, oh, awesome. Warm relationship. Let's go into it. Walk to this person's office and they were just like, dude, fuck off. Walk on the police. We're not going to newspaper again. Like this is a, like, this is shit. We've got nothing from you. We've advertised for two years. You keep coming back every single quarter that we, even though we're telling wow. you not to piss off right now. And I was just like, whoa like what i thought these were good clients and it happened like again and again and again because this guy like like newspapers are you know magazines are on, on decline like who, who reads yeah those? but this guy was such a bulldog and in a way it's good but he didn't he went too far to the other extreme mm-hmm. where he just literally go into a local business and just go like i'm not leaving unless you pay me to be in my magazine wow and so like you go for enough of those times and people put up with it for a little bit but mm. eventually they're just like I've given you three grand, like, f- like over the past every, every quarter for the past two years. I've got nothing back from. I'm not going to invest, but you keep turning up and not leaving. Like, leave, or I'm going to call the cops. And so it was like that kind of relationship wow, we it was had, relentless, yeah. rather than like, you know, he was like, "Oh, everybody loves me. They're going to love you. We're going to sell a bunch." Yeah. And I'm just like, <laughs> "Oh." So that was just like, yeah, that was the point where, um, you know, I realized I think I made a really big mistake, but that was also what forced me to leave the corporate in, in the first place. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's so that was your last journey. corporate job. That was my last corporate job, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then did you set up Growth Labs right after that, or because mm-hmm. yeah, you were so Growth Labs so, was right? So, after. Growth Labs was running, um, it was, it was my side, side gig, my side hustle, um, for about a year before I went full time into it. Yeah. Um, so I was like, you know, on my lunch breaks, I'd be making calls and trying to get clients and after hours, I'd be going to networking, all this kind of stuff. And, um, just, yeah, massive side hustle to, yep. to build it. Yeah. So it sounds like it was kind of a traditional pathway that you took in terms of, well, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, going into corporate, got married, had kids, pretty stable, mm. and then you just flipped. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I was. Railing against tradition, but I went along with it yeah. up until that point. 
Was that willing, like willingly? No, <laughs> hell no. I was, um, I was I'm, I'm the black sheep of my family. Like mm-hmm. we all joke about it, but my brother's a doctor. So like legit. <laughs> no pressure. Actual doctor, right? Like so my parents are like, going up child. and she's like, what the fuck happened to you? Like, <laughs> like uh, I, I was about to go to university with like a sports scholarship to to, to play rugby league, mm-hmm. um, which in case anyone's international listen to this, it's like the most brutal sport you can play yeah. for your body. Um, and, you know, I was – constantly getting trampled over by like 140 kilo um, uh, Maoris and Islanders. And I'm like a 60 kilo dude uh, when I was playing. And it's just like, man, this is this is tough. Yeah. Um, so I tried to go through that path um, growing up, but it didn't work out. Um, I didn't like uni at all. I partied my way through uni, barely in memory. I was in like spewing the gutters most weekends. Um, and it took me six or seven years to do a three-year degree. Wow. Just because I couldn't find what I liked. And I kept changing because they kept threatening to kick me out because I kept failing subjects. Right. So every time they did I'd jump to a new university, new degree and go again. But eventually I, I figured out how to game the system because um, I was selling like one or two websites on the side. Um, just again, as a, I've always been entrepreneurial, so it was a bit of a side hustle. And I had hired people from India at that point to, to do these websites. And so for my assignments at uni, I ended up doing IT because my dad was in IT. So he helped me with a lot of my assignments. Mm-hmm. But it got to the point where I'm just like, I haven't been to a single class. I haven't been to a single lecture. I have no idea what I'm going for. There's a huge assignment coming up. Hey, dude in India building my website. Can you do my assignment? And they actually really? did it. And that's how I passed uni. Uh, my assignments used to get like full marks because the code was super, super clean and super good. But then in, in exams, I'd actually fail. Like right. because I had no freaking idea what I was doing. So you didn't do the assignments. No, exactly. And so when I got put in front of the chancellor and they're like, you know, what's going on here? Why are your assignments so good? Are you plagiarizing? I just be like, Oh, I just get so stressed with exams. I can't think of it. So that's how I go for uni. I bullshit my way. I literally bullshit my way for uni. Um, but that's how I got my degree. Um, so yes, a traditional path. But within that, I found like my own little scope to be a little loopholes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> that's that's the journey. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Like that's because I think for as long as we've known each other, um, I think the the impression that I have a lot of the time is like. Um, you're like a serial opportunist. That's probably like the best way to describe it, which is like you can see loopholes, you can see gaps, you can see opportunities in things that like I know we were just talking about it literally like just before the start. I was like all these business ideas that you're like, I was like, why are we why are we doing marketing agencies? Like, you know, because like and I think that's probably like an innate quality. Is it is that something that you've always been like that or is it um, something that you maybe, uh, I don't know, learned it from somewhere? Where did you get that sort of quality from? I think it's a, that's a really good question. I think it's a bit of a mix. Um, so growing up, I think I've always had a bit of an entrepreneurial streak. Uh, for example, when we used to live in this apartment block, um, one of the business ideas I had, and this was when I was like younger than 10, was I would go collect people's mails from the letterboxes, knock on the door and actually deliver the mail in exchange for like 50 cents. Wow. Um, didn't work out because who wants a man to yeah. keep going for your mail, right? Like <laughs> privacy. Here. Um, but like, I remember that being one of my ideas when I was younger, but then like, I know parents are quite traditional as a lot of, you know, our parents' generation are. They kind of got beaten out of me. So I think I had a bit of a streak and then I lost it because it was more like, hey, going back to what's traditional. But then um, I think as I've been in business more like for a longer period of time, as I've matured and grown as an entrepreneur, I've come back to this like place where, man, there's so many, there's no way I can capture every single opportunity because there's just so much opportunity out there. Right. Um, so I think it's a bit like a bit of a myth. It's, it's almost taught because, you know, one of the things that we took complain about marketing agencies all the time and what we do, but it's so interesting because it gives you the model of how our clients run the business and it, you see behind the scenes of client businesses and it opens your mind to so many different opportunities and thoughts that you might not have had if you were just like, in, in a different type of industry yeah. or just did one thing, you know yep. what I mean? So um, I think it's a bit of both. Um, it's the exposure. It's the, the exposure, yeah. yeah. But I've always been entrepreneurial. I've always seen opportunities in, in weird places, I um, guess you call it. Mm. Um, yeah, but I think having the exposure and having the, the growth through having an actual business that – works with all these other different types of businesses has definitely been helpful. Has the way that your parents brought you up influenced that a lot? Um, I don't think it has um, in that like one of my memories is my my parents did try a couple of businesses, Mm -hmm. but they both kind of failed. Um, And so I think from that experience, um, they were more conservative because they had tried and failed. Um, So for them, it was more about protecting yourself. 
not trying all these things and just having a safe path. Like for my dad to you know come over here from China with nothing except the clothes on his back and do all of that, obviously security is just the biggest thing and they've lived their life with security as the number one metric. Mm-hmm. Uh, am I getting paid next month? Yes, I am. Everything's good in the world. So that was the kind of mentality they passed on because they, they don't really, like that was what helped them survive, right? Yeah. But like for us here, you know, when I had the entrepreneurial mentality and I wanted to do things differently, they were just like, why? Like for them, I think it's almost the point where like, why are you squandering this huge opportunity that we've gone out of our way to, to get for you? Mm. Um, because you don't see like entrepreneurship's hard. Like you don't see the result of what you do for like five or 10 years potentially. Mm-hmm. And it could be the completely wrong thing. And you've wasted like 10 years of your life chasing this pipe dream. Um, and I think that's like the complete opposite of having security. So I think the mentality, you know, I, th- I think people are getting better at it now, yeah. um, like especially with our generation. Like we've seen other Asian entrepreneurs in, you know, Australia, US, wherever these Asians are, they've done really, really well. Um, so it's becoming more commonplace. But I think in our parents' generation, there the were the exceptional, you know, one or two people that did awesome, but most of them were just like security-based. So I think if anything, they were, they were very against me taking this path to begin with. Um, but now that we've had, and I don't use the word success lightly, um, some moderate success is just like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe it was an okay path. So steering off of that less traditional Asian path, oh. what was the reaction of all your friends and family? I think my parents are so against it. <laughs> so they were just like, what are you doing? Like, because if you look at it from the outside, I found my way through uni. My parents know that my marks were absolute shit. Like, it was absolutely dog shit. I was just like, are you getting kicked out again? <laughs> like, yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry, bad. Um, so for them, it's just like, it almost, I think from their perspective, it's like I lucked into the jobs that I did because I went from not even having graduated uni to being accepted into a graduate job at Coca-Cola. And, but the thing is like, no one asked me, hey, have you actually finished your IT degree? They just assumed I had because I had, you know, the boss to rock up the interview for graduate. It's on your resume. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's on my resume. I never said I finished it, but yeah. no one asked me. Yeah, no one asked. It. So it's like my parents are like, you've lucked into it where like I was, I was 24 years old making 120 grand a year as an IT consultant. My parents were just like, you've made it. Like you've legitimately made it. You know, my dad's like, um, I think he's probably made like 80 to 90 K um, a year for his like entire career after winning to IT. Like that was just for him, it was just like sweet, like security, working for a big company, I'm happy. And I was just like this, like, you know, you're 24 years old, you failed away, away for uni. You now make 120K, 150K a year in IT in a secure job. Like you're living the dream. Like you've, you've, you've done it, right? So um, yeah, they're, they're, they were just like, what are you doing? You're throwing your entire life away. You're, you're pissing away everything you've, well, I didn't work hard for it, but like you're pissing away everything <laughs> that we've worked hard for. Like we've been into you and you're just chasing this pipe dream. And, you know, so that was the reaction my parents had. Um, friends were, I think one of the things that, I've learned about entrepreneurship is that going into business for yourself, it really opens your eyes to the people that you hang around with because I had what I thought were really good friends in in IT and we went through it together, went through the struggle. But when I told them, Hey, I'm going to go into business myself, like, Oh, you're going to be used car salesman. Go get your tie grease back your hair. Tell me some of your used car Toyota. I'm like, it's not like <laughs> they just don't understand. Yeah. But I think it's also like in Australia, especially, you know, we've got tall poppy and yeah. if you're trying to make moves and trying to do something, it's a lot of like, I think it's perceived as, you know, if you do well, what, what you know, like what does oh, make have us? I failed, yeah. right? And especially amongst the friends in IT, I had like a lot of them were really smart, great programmers. I was definitely the dumbest of the bunch. I was just like, bees, bees, bees. <laughs> so they were just like, this fucking idiot is going to go out and start his own business. Yeah, good luck. But, you know, if I made it, that would have been like, holy shit, like, what are we doing? Like, we just, you know, and for me, it was like, I I got it because I looked down the same path I was working on, they were working on. And like in 40 years time, looking at our managers and their managers, it's like, it's pretty depressing. And so they're like, oh, this guy's trying to go do something different. And if he makes it, holy shit, does that mean we're not on the right path? So you got them to kind of think about their life choices. Yeah. Very so, I, so I get it. So I get it. But, you know, it was... Um, kind of difficult in terms of like no one gets it until you've walked the path in the mm-hmm. journey uh, or, you know, unless you've taken the risk to try and experience for yourself, it, people just don't intuitively get it. Um, yeah. So I think that's the experience that I had. 
Mm-hmm. What about your wife? <coughs> she's been super supportive since day one. Um, she's actually like her family have been so entrepreneurial. So she's seen it from her dad. It's the norm. Um, mm-hmm. It's the norm. And so like, you know, she is like literally just ride or die. Uh, my ride or die. She's been so supportive. There's a point in the business where I'm like, babe, I'm so sorry. We can't pay the mortgage next month. I fucked up. Um, let me just go back and find a job. Like literally we were, we, were, we struggled so hard for like three years. Like literally mm. went backwards. We had money saved up, blew through that. We had um, our mortgage actually went up and like a house went up in Valley. So we had equity, put all of that out, put into the business and lost all of that. And at the point where like, I was like on the floor, just going, fuck babe. Like I've, I'm so sorry. I've, I've fucked up. I've put us 10 years behind where all of our friends are like all of our friends are like chilling out having mm. life like enjoying themselves and they're looking at me going oh fucking good job man mm. business man oh yeah <laughs> and i was like fuck i'm so sorry babe like you know if like I, I don't know what i did why i did it for and she was like and she turned around and she said look i've gone through all this shit and um she saw it before i think she goes no you've grown as an entrepreneur like you've this business mm. is at the point where it, it's we're almost there like, don't give up. Just just keep going. Give yourself two more months. I'm like, but we can't, like, we don't have too much. She goes, sell one of the cars. Like, you know, and I was driving like a shitbox. She goes, just sell that. It, it's, it'll pay our bills for next month. Give us like a month of breathing room. Just do that and go. And um, in that, right after she, she said that, literally the business switched in, in 30 days and we started paying the bills again and we didn't have to take money out. And it was just like, fuck. And she saw that. When, when, relief, where, where I yeah. Didn't. yeah so she's been like my like my my the biggest advantage i've had of everybody else that i've you know known business is is like my home life is fucking solid like my wife is amazing my biggest fan like that's if i didn't have on my side i don't think i would have done it like i definitely would have quit you would have tapped um, out earlier i would have tapped out way earlier <clears throat> way earlier you're right yeah it's wild because i know like you and i have um <clears throat> we're the same business coach um James Shramko and mm. like we're in the same community. I remember really early days, like even before I sort of joined, um, sort of having James as a business coach. Um, I don't know. I can't remember what it was, but it was like there was a particular, um, I want to say it was like a training session or something that you ran and you were saying, you know, you're like this introverted Asian dude and you had a lot of trouble just like talking to people, like period, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So, and I, and I think this is a challenge amongst, um, and Viv and I just had this conversation like literally an hour ago saying, um, we sort of look at people within our circle, um, Asian backgrounds, and the, we sort of live in a bubble because yeah. when you sort of go to school, if you go to a school that's like dominant Asians and you go to like your friends and family are all Asians, mm-hmm. all of a sudden you get, you know, you, you graduate from high school and you go to uni and you're literally like out in the real world and you start interacting with, you know, obviously people who are non-Asians mm-hmm. and people struggle. Like I felt like I struggled a fair bit, yep. not just like talking to non-Asians, but just like in general, right? So, um what was it? Did you do something to help you with coming out of your shell and being able to communicate really well? Because that's not something that you sort of just flick a switch on and it just turns on. Yeah, dude. I, I like. There's no shortcuts. Um, I literally ate shit for like fucking three years straight. Mm-hmm. I literally just said to myself, I need to talk to one person a day, regardless of how it's done. I went to every networking thing I could find. Even ones where just like you know five people in a room trying to pitch to each other. I just went to everything, talked to everyone I could because. Like when, when your why is big enough, you'll find a way. Like my why is like, I've quit for the wrong reasons. I've been tricked into quitting my job. How do I support my family? Oh shit, I need to make sales. Like I literally have to make sales and put food on the table, right? I've got two kids at home. My wife stopped working so she can take care of the kids. I've got to step up and like do my role. And so I had no choice but to talk to people. I had no choice but to just like cold call or door knock or do all this shit that just like terrified the shit out of me but i had no choice so i had to um and i think having gone through that and done it enough times you start to realize oh nothing bad's gonna happen like the worst thing is someone go turn around and goes oh fuck off like cool have a good day man you too <laughs> like it's yeah. like, nothing to lose leave, bounce yeah. like that's it like there's you know there's so little to lose it's all in our own minds and i think the first cold call the first phone conversation the first time you're up on stage that's the scariest like if you can get through the first one you can get through the next one if you can get through the next one you can get through the first 10 you get through the first 10 you're going to get better you're going to get through 100 like at this point i've probably done thousands upon thousands of the phone mm. like sales calls and phone calls and it's just like it's second nature to me whereas when i first started i could not like 
I just did, and this isn't exaggerating. Like I was so bad on the phone that even when I spoke to my wife on the phone back in the other day, she used to be, Hey, look, babe, just, just text me. Just text me. <laughs> like, like, like I was nervous wreck. I couldn't hold a phone conversation. I used to stutter. I'd like sweat everywhere on the phone. I was like an, a nervous wreck with the phone. I literally a phone phobia. Like it must've been wow. phone phobia because I was okay talking to people face to face. I was like, not great, like yeah. not good, but. Like I could survive it, but the phone and a phone conversation was like terrifying for me. So, but you do it enough times where it's like second nature. Just force yourself um, into it. You just got to force yourself. Yeah. Is it is it mm. worth doing? So, for example, it's just contextual, right? Because for me, that was my escape. That was my journey. That was my path. So, I it wasn't like this sucks so much. I don't want to do this. It's like it sucks, but I have to do it. I've got no choice. Whereas if it's something that you don't, you're not passionate about, or you don't care about, it's not your big why, you move away from pain really easily. So it's more about like finding out, like, is it even worth doing? Is it your why? If it is, you'll find a way to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As long as there's purpose, as long as there's drive, there's yeah. all that sort of stuff that's happening, exactly. right? Otherwise, you're just going through the motions, I feel like, with this stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, as well. Sounds like you're a pretty big family man, though. Like. <laughs> Yeah, it's a yeah, big value of yours. Probably the one main thing. I think it's probably the reason why I built my business the way the way it is. Because we're like, my team are fully remote. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got employees all over the world, and one of the things I'm very careful of is schedule. Like I live on my calendar, and so I'm very conscious that if I let it get full, it will get full. Um, so I schedule family stuff in. I make sure that you know on the weekends, like. In, in saying that, like, it's this is how it works now, but it wasn't when the business was first starting out. Like, there's obviously a massive period of sacrifice where you can't, like, when you're making no money and a client wants you to call them on a Saturday or a Sunday, you call them on a Saturday or Sunday. Uh, but now I'm lucky enough where, like, our top priority is family and health, um, one and two. And then if you're, if my family life's good, if life at home is good, right, if I'm happy at home, if my body's healthy, my mind's sharp, there's a million opportunities I can chase. But if any of those two other things are out of whack, there's no point having a hundred million dollars in the bank because yeah. that's the main two things I'm going to focus on. Um, so I've always been conscious of like the two main pillars being family and health. And if if two of that's good, I mean, what do we really have to complain about? Yeah, is that are those values ingrained into you from how you grew up? Are your parents very family oriented? Yeah, yeah, they, they are. So um, yeah, we we definitely we definitely value family. Like I think a lot of um, like the Asian background is very about, very much about family, right? Yeah. And if you look at, say, China, for example, where I've got some contextual knowledge, people are still living with their parents, the parents old, until right. they really can't take care of them. Mm-hmm. And the grandparents really help bring up grandkids. There's a level of respect. Kids get taught, oh, if you serve, if you're serving dinner, you serve the grandparents first, all that yeah. kind of stuff. So we had the same traditional values pass through, which I think was actually really, really good. Um, and then. You know, you know, because it's something that we value so much, it's something that we're passing through as well. But yeah, definitely, definitely came from my parents. Um, uh, yeah. They built a really good foundation for you guys then. Yeah. Yeah. So there's obviously like, there's a lot of, when you listen to other um, podcasts or to, other people talk about the family, yeah. a lot of people talk shit about their family and stuff like that, but it's so contextual because yeah. the world that you grew up in is so different. Um, but I know for a fact that the family values was did come from my parents. So that was one of the things they've done. You know, a lot of things that I don't do now as a parent because I've got more knowledge or more context into how we're growing up, how to bring up kids. But you know, the core of what they taught was kind of still there, even if I'm changing a few other things around. Yeah, well, going off of that, we were talking about it previously. How um, you wanted to homeschool your kids. Is that based off of you wanting to travel and stuff like that? <laughs> um, it we didn't want it. Like I, I thought homeschool kids would be weirdos in the corner, like <laughs> with like weird haircuts and strange names. <laughs> like, well, like, so I had both my wife and I had really um, strong preconceived notion of what homeschooling was. Yep. Uh, but then COVID hit, and then it's like. It's really funny because Australian internet is so shit. Like every time it rains, into my home yeah. like, just dies. <laughs> and so I'll be on Zoom calls trying to get clients on board. My kids will be trying to take Zoom calls from home, and our internet will be getting hammered. And the kids hated Zoom, and the teachers couldn't control them. And like this was during COVID when we first, when the whole world first went into lockdown. And so my wife's a teacher, and she said, "Look, I think the kids are really young at this point. I've got a handle of, of the curriculum." why don't we just take him out of school for six months until we get out of this quarantine pandemic kind of crap and then we'll put him back into school. 
And so I was like, all right, cool. No one's socializing anyway. So, you know, the risk of desocialization, I, I thought, was very low. Mm-hmm. Zoom was super confusing, super weird, just wasn't effective as a teaching method. Um, and so we just thought, look, there's no real risk in doing that. Let's just do that. And so we started homeschooling. And, um, you know, my, my daughter, when she started kindergarten, had an amazing kindergarten teacher. And she made my daughter fall in love with learning and in and, and school and, like, reading. And I was like, man, this is amazing. But then in year one, it was the complete opposite, where my, my daughter's teacher, like, couldn't even bother showing up half the time. Aww. Like, she, oh, um, she'd come home and be like, oh, yeah, miss so-and-so. Oh, she hurt her back, so she's not going to be here this week. I'm like, Oh, really? wow. Like a whole week? She's like, yeah, a yeah, whole week. And I'm like, oh, Miss So and so, she she went on a holiday with her fiance. She's getting married, so she's taking leave. I'm like, hang on. So she was there for like almost less than half the school school year. Yeah. And so my daughter started falling behind and I was just like, it just showed me like how vulnerable the children are to good and bad teachers. But you can't like if you're putting them in the school system, how do you guarantee that even if it's a good teacher for someone else, it might not be for your child. And so as we started homeschooling, they started really accelerating in terms of how quickly they were learning mm. and how much they were, they were retaining and how much they were just enjoying learning the way they were. Mm. And so like if you think about it, you know, when they were in school, like they got they got you know, Timmy in the corner picking his nose, punching the other kids. Yeah. The teacher just stop in class every two minutes. He's like, Timmy, shut up and sit down. And everything slows down to where the slowest kid in school is. Um, whereas at homeschool, we just let our kids learn at their own pace. And the pace was so much faster than what we thought it was. So the learning took off. We're like, oh, this is pretty cool. And But then as soon as we started coming out of lockdown, there's so many homeschool groups in, uh, they started from the lockdown. So I was really worried about socialization more than the education piece. But like my kids have had, they got three set play, play groups every every week. So they actually spend like four to five hours each time at these play groups. So socializing with other kids more than they are at school anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, they've got activities like we'll take them to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. They'll learn that. They'll yeah. go to the Muay Thai class. They'll go to art classes, music classes. And the stuff that they pick themselves, they really got a self interest and, and a love yeah. for it. But they're also socializing as well within that context. Um, and yeah, like it helps to travel. So um, when I used to travel a lot, it used to be like, oh, you know, start missing the family and, and <laughs> second and second travel. But now it's like every single trip I take, they go with me. It's like this big adventure and I learn about the world. So yeah. it's been it's been awesome. Like it really has. Yeah. Wow. Are they are they good to travel with? Like the kids? Mm. They, yeah. They're good travelers. They're amazing travellers. They're yeah. really very good lucky. Travelers. That's so good. Yeah, I've yeah. seen nightmares. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I've seen the opposite. I think we they were really bad in the car when they were young. Yeah. yeah. Really, really bad in the car. Um, but surprisingly good in the airplanes. <laughs> so it's and it just worked out really well that I mean when COVID hit, it was like it, like I know COVID was really tough for a lot of people, but we kind of lucked out because both in terms of the home life. And um, going to homeschooling with the kids, that was really lucky because COVID forced us to do it. So it forced us to see the side that was really good. Um, and, and then in business, like our business grew up, blew up during like in a good way during yeah. COVID. So we we were very, very fortunate, very, very lucky um, for that situation to be, in, to, to be where we were. Do you find that, um, I guess, the demographic of how many people are homeschooling as well is more common now with... Um, I guess our Asian generation as well, because we've got more education and more knowledge of how to, I guess, raise kids or our own experiences. Yeah, I mean, I don't go to as many homeschool events as I should. My wife is still definitely the main person taking care of the kids, mm-hmm. but you know, I'm hearing that there's there's lots of halfies. Right? She's like, oh, oh okay. like there's halfie, and you know, um, but I think, I think it, with our generation, it it is going to be more of of a common theme because like we see things differently to how our parents see like our parents just like go to school go to university and it's very set yeah whereas we've we've had our eyes open to like all these this opportunity so um you know and we're having these conversations where we normally you know our parents will never have these conversations you know like if if one of their friends is homeschooling the kids are like all right let's keep away from that yeah don't even forget my family that, <laughs> that bullshit like um but we, the fact that we're having this conversation like conversations lead to you know exploring and you know so i think i think it's definitely going to be one of those things that um does come up a bit more and especially if you look at like the way that people work and the way that people realize well we can there's more freelancers than ever before there's more people you know self-employed or whole digital nomad things more digital nomads on, yeah. so everyone's starting to i think more and more people start the question like why do we need to do it the way we used to do it before um, we've got all these other alternatives yeah but i also think like 
you know, Asians being very risk averse and they're always mm. going down like the safe pathway. The preconceived notion was that if you got a good paying job at a stable company, it was really safe. And then when the pandemic came along, it was like, you ain't that safe, yeah. right? A lot of people were laid off. Um, a lot of things mm. changed. A lot of people re-questioned their careers and that sort of stuff. And it was weird because I felt like um, certain businesses, while some of them suffered, I think like businesses like ours, which were more digital based and we were like fully remote and we were almost like ready for the pandemic that um, we thrived like in this situation. So it's it's weird to sort of see that backflip and then now a lot more people, like I feel like I've spoken to a lot more people who are talking about things like being a digital nomad or like working location independent. And this was something that, um, you know, prior to like setting up Social Wave, I, I did a year of travel. I was like doing the thing and I like, I wanted to do it, I loved it. But I remember this was like 2019, uh, no one was really seeing that as an opportunity. And what was really strange was when I was telling people about me going away, they were like, whoa, you're really brave. Like, this is really like um, a really courageous thing. And, I, and in my head, I'm like, this is nothing. This is, I just, it's like, you talk about the why. It's like, I always wanted to do this. It was like the thing. And like, almost I had to get it off my chest. So I had to do it. Otherwise I'd be kicking myself like 10 years down the track saying I never did it. So it's, it's funny and bizarre how like sometimes you see things um, ahead of like, I guess the curve. And, and then you see a few years later how it manifests. I suppose the other example, like if we're talking about business here was like, I remember we first started, um, my girlfriend and I, we, we started out our own um, business selling terrariums, which is like, oh, you know, like and terrariums are amazing. Dude, I, I love oh, terrariums. Terrariums are amazing, right? <laughs> I love, I love that shit. So this was like 2015, 2016. This hell? was like well ahead of terrariums, <laughs> except we didn't know how to do any marketing at the time. <laughs> our form of marketing was like literally going to Glebe markets on a Saturday and setting up oh. like a, um, a tent there and paying like, I think it was like $150 per week for it. And people wouldn't buy because people, when they go to Glebe markets, they just browse and they don't yeah. do anything. So... Um, I guess my point is, is that it's like, it's all this perception of like what is safe and what mm -hmm. is, but in actual fact, it's not. And um, I'd be curious to get your take. It's like, if you were someone, if you had to give advice, because obviously you've been, you've been doing business for so long now. Yeah. If you're someone like, if you, like, if you think about our listeners right now, they may be like someone who's either in high school, maybe uni, or maybe they're working a corporate job and they're looking to go out and do their own thing and they're hating what they're doing. Um, what would be sort of your advice, I guess, in terms of how you would approach it? I think I would say... And I don't want people watching, listening to this to, to come at it from a negative angle. But I would say, like, we're all fucking going to die soon. You know what I mean? Like, you've got one life. You've got one shot at this shit. Why not do everything, like, have everything you want, be everything you want to be, go where you want to go? Like, why would I settle for mediocre? Like, I don't get a second chance at this shit. It's either I experience this, this amazing ride, this thrilling experience, and you know, love this shit out of everything I do, the people I hang with, or I can go through miserable and at the end of it, just turn back and go, oh, I wish I'd done something completely different. I, I didn't want to be in the position where you're at the end of your life in a nursing home going, oh, what was the point? Mm. Like that's, that for me is so scary. I, 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 I'm willing to sacrifice going bankrupt, going, you know, homeless and living with my in-laws for like 20 years if I gave it a shot. So I'm not mm -hmm. going to look back and go, maybe I should have. Like, no, I've, I'll put it all on the line now. The risks that you think are bad probably aren't going to end you. Like, you can go broke trying to do a business, but are you going to die from it? Like, in Australia, probably not. Like, you've got, you know. Welfare is good. Yeah, welf yeah. Welfare is good. Um, you know, if you get sick, Medicare is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously – but please don't take that advice. <laughs> <laughs> so like, this will go, Tommy, to go to now. I'm like, <laughs> home. I'm like, job. <laughs> like this guy, I'm going to so like, don't like, but obviously, you know, there's if, if, like, if you think about the risk, what are the biggest risks that can happen? Well, everything blows up. You go through your life savings. You end up living with your in-laws. Is that that bad of a life anyway? Still like, alive. It's, like, you're still alive. Yeah. As long as you're breathing, you've got another shot. You've got mm -hmm. another opportunity. Um, but the only time that, you know, you don't is when you give up. So for me, it's like knowing all of that, like knowing that I've only got one shot at this, um, you know, I want to experience everything. Like people, I think a lot of people dream too small. Or they go, oh, if I can just have a comfortable life, that's great. Mm. But I was like, like, I want to drive a Ferrari. I want to drive a Lamborghini. I want to know how it feels to fly first class. Mm -hmm. I want to know how it feels to have like a personal chef. All these kind of stuff. I might not like it, but I want to know what it's like because I've only got one shot at this life. So why wouldn't I experience everything to see what's actually important to me? Yeah, it's like I think it. people um – People live like they're going to live forever. Like mm. they've got infinite amount of yeah. time. And I think the reality check that I had 
um, was experiencing like some close family member getting really severely ill way before their time. Like, mm. as in they should not have gotten this sick at that point in time. And that was like a serious check for me. I was like, wow, like, yeah, like you said, life is like super short. And I think, um, you know, at least in the Asian community, there's um, a lot of that thinking. It's like, they think that I'm just going to live forever. Like I'll live to a hundred and like I've got still, I've well. still got time. Yeah. Mm. And like, you know, that's like that sort of cliche. It's like some days, not a day of the week, you know? Yeah. So therefore, if you don't have it locked in and you don't have something that you're moving towards, then what's the point? So <clears throat> I feel like it's a, um, it's partly like a fear of failure. Like people don't want to Scared of the unknown. They're scared of the unknown, mm. but also I think people don't want to look stupid. Mm. Like we, we spoke about this um, previously, which was um, there's a lot of judgment. Like there's a lot of like, oh, if like, you know, like you said, like you go out and like people judging you starting your own business, right? Mm. And I think that like there's this innate fear that people don't like the judgment that comes with it. Um, so, I, yeah, obviously you experienced that um, from your own personal okay. experiences, but within your group of friends, do you have any other friends who are like doing business, you know, particularly those who are in Asian background and that sort of stuff as well? Um, I would say most of my friends now are actually business owners just because I, I've, I've still got, you know, good friends who, who are with me from the start, um, go back, but like a lot of them don't get it. And so a lot of the conversations where it's like, you know, some of the friends I've had from high school, they're, they're prime. The best days were in high school, and so every conversation is like, "Do you like, remember? This? Remember, remember when we were playing this other team and I scored this mad try and you know tackled this dude?" It's like I'm like, it's like 20 years ago. Like, <laughs> like you know, there's there's surely better things to talk about. And but like, it, it's sad because some of them are so sheltered and you know it's like they're so afraid of risk that their best years are already behind them. And so I think for me, most of my friends now are actually business owners and, and you know, entrepreneurs just because the conversation is so much more interesting. Like instead of discussing people or gossiping about people, if I don't like someone now, like see it, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to interact with you. Yeah. Like, you yeah, know, I, I didn't pick yeah. up the, like nothing, right? So I, I've i tuned out all negativity and all negative people from my life. Yeah. And so all of my friends now, we just talk big ideas. Like, mm -hmm. hey, look at this opportunity. What do you reckon of this? So I think just naturally how I think now and the way that I've, I've structured you know, life. It's not like I purposely move people out, but I've only got so much energy and I don't want to deal with negativity. So I've grad, um, you know, gravitated to these entrepreneurs now where we do discuss like the positivity or like the opportunities rather than like the past or, or things that are negative. So um, yeah, most of my network now is actually all, all business owners. Mm, yeah, that's interesting because I feel like that's the same experience with me. You know, you hang around with I went through a phase where I hung around with like the high school friends mm -hmm. and you had this like mixed bag. Some were really, really successful in the traditional mm -hmm. sense, like corporate jobs, getting well paid. Um, and then you had a portion who were just like, you, you know, they just, you know, average in the sense of like, the, you know, they were doing retail jobs and that sort of stuff. And then you had like these outliers without they're like doing like all these business ventures and a whole bunch of other crazy stuff. Some that are like literally still out there partying to this day, mm -hmm. you know, and um and what I found was since starting up the business, I found myself hanging around more business owners because the conversation was like much more interesting. And then sort of when you intertwine that with, you know, a lot of the business owners I know, like you and I, Asian business owners, then the conversation becomes really sort of different. I feel like you and I probably haven't talked about it all that much in mm -hmm. terms of like how it ties in with Asians. It's partly because we don't, we don't, I, I guess, tie our identity to being Asian business owners. Mm -hmm. But um, I think at least how out here, you know, we're filming like in Western Sydney, it's like um, I, I'm talking to a lot of business owners in Western Sydney and I'm getting a lot of like stories about how um, very similar they sort of went through the non-traditional pathway. Well, they started in the traditional pathway, um, had a lot of experiences that they didn't fit in with the, either the system or the yeah. expectations and then ended up um, going out there and, and doing their own thing. One of the things I really um, was really funny because I was like, you know, out just having a few drinks and, and one of them uh, after a few drinks because you're a bit more open, they're like <laughs> said to me, he said, it's uh, it's lonely at the top, <laughs> you know. Like, do you ever get that? Like, with being a business owner, it 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 is, it is because, like, how do you talk to someone about the feeling that you can't pay a mortgage, hmm. right? How do you talk to someone about like knowing that you, you you fucked up and you've you've lost a hundred grand? Like, that's not something that. The it's not that everyday general, conversation, it's, right? Right. It's not something that you talk to, you know, you don't rock up, hey, bro, how you get, yeah, man, I lost 100 grand. I was like, <laughs> it's not, it's not, you know, like it's how do you relate that kind of understanding and, and worldview and experience to someone who hasn't gone through something similar before? Like, it's just a bit of a, it, it, it's hard. Right? And I think also 
like the the mentality of the grit that you need to have as a business owner and the way that you need to think about things if you if you if you weren't persistent if you weren't resilient you would have given up so early on so everybody who has a successful business i found has gone through some stage of massive struggle so that changes you makes you force you to grow stronger and changes your person i i think i'm a completely different person six years on than when I was when I first started my business. Like I'm, I'm night and day different person. I think that's a good thing. But like, if I'm having conversation with myself from six years ago, like I'm going to be literally running a therapy session. Like, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do it. Like, that's what I would have been like. Like, how do you, whereas if you've gone through it already, you've got that confidence that you just can't fake. Whereas like, I've gone through some shit. I've seen some shit. Now I'm having different conversation. And so that's what I find. Like it's, and, you know, the percentage of the population, like, it, I don't know if that's the right way to, to describe it because it makes it sound like, you know, we're special, but, but we're not. We're just like someone who's eating shit a lot longer than someone who hasn't. Yeah. But it's like, um, but they come, like not as many people have experienced that, you know, so therefore, unless you're catching up with other people who have gone through it, 99% of the people you have right. in, in the world don't understand the same It's the relatability. Exactly. So... Like when people will turn around and they go, oh, you're paying for it. Look at you rocking up in your car with all that kind of bullshit. They haven't experienced everything that came before it. So they they don't understand you in a way that other entrepreneurs do. Mm. And therefore, I think that's where the loneliness comes through. Mm. Adversity brings different perspectives as well. Like it builds character. And also how you guys were saying how you surround yourself with more business owners once you've reached a new group that has a higher ceiling, you guys can all relate to that rather than staying down here, for example, like high school, that's where you regress constantly back to those Correct. conversations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would say, look, waste is a strong word, but I felt like I did waste probably – from the time I started uni, probably, you know, the next six or seven years in, 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 in a career standpoint, because, you know, like, I don't know, I call it the, you know, obviously the, um, the Sydney based people listening to this will understand. It's like, I call it like the selective school, um, mm. impact, the influence, yeah. which is selective schools are not, um, inherently like they don't have necessarily better teachers. They don't have a better curriculum, whatever. Right. It's the idea of shoving, an entire cohort of high achieving people in a single room together. And that is what causes you to strive higher. So it's like that classic thing of like the average of the five people around you, which is um, it, when you surround yourself with people who are better than you. And, and I've got a sort of philosophy around being like literally the dumbest person in the room. Cause mm. if that's the case, yeah, then amazing, you know, you just, yeah. you sponge, you just absorb it all in. Um, it's, it's the same thing. And, um, I think a lot of people enjoy the idea of being the smartest one in the room. They like, like the ego stroke of like saying I'm the go-to success story. And like you mentioned, like, so the friends who go back to the romantic periods of like high school going, oh, this is like, do you remember that time? And, you know, so I, I also experienced like friends like that. Um, and one of the things was just, um, you sort of like that. I think people like relationships that you have sort of serve a time and a place at a certain stage and then it's time to like move on. It doesn't mean you just mm -hmm. sort of mostly like cut them off. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, I, I do remember like at least particularly in high school, it's like we're like we're going to be friends forever, especially like during gradu graduation period. We're like, oh, we're going to like keep in touch. We're going to do like a reunion <laughs> every year. Never happens, Never right? Happens. Never happens. Um, so I guess to sort of like round it, you know, all back together again, I think everyone sort of walks down different pathways once you, particularly once you leave school because um, then you have all these pathways you can go. So I'm always like super interested to hear, you know, what people's experiences are like, you know, as not just business owners, but like doing their own thing. Um, and more importantly, it's like, um, was it a easy pathway or was it a difficult pathway? And like, what is it? And like for yourself, um, was it, were there like, I guess two or three things or whatever that number is that really helped you propel into better business success? Like whether it's people, resources, mm -hmm. Um, things you found, things you discovered. Was there anything specifically there? That's a really good question. Um, I'll just rattle off some some shit off. Some yeah, just spitball. Yeah, yeah. I think looking back and reflecting, and I think that there are definite things that were a massive advantage to me in terms of like, and I use success loosely because I still view myself in my business like small fry, like 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 this ring thing <laughs> business, right? Um, but I think one of the things that I do really well is. I seek advice 
and then I'm open to receiving the advice. And I think that's two different things, but I do both really well. So some people are like, oh, I need a mentor. I do, you know, Ryan need a coach. And they go find the best coach and best mentor. And they just don't do, don't listen to them. Don't right. think. It's like, dude, what are you doing? Uh, but I'm really good at both those things. I'm good at taking other people's opinions on board, thinking about it from my context, and then using what's good and discarded, discarding what's not. But I always hear their opinions and I'll always hear why. And I always think about <clears throat> Why, I, why they're telling me this, what are their worldviews and experiences to be giving me this? So I think the fact that I seek out help um, and I'm really open to getting help and to getting advice, I think has just been instrumental in, in how, we, how we've grown. Mm. So would you uh, say like obviously with James, James Shramko, you know, he's an example of someone who you sought out for advice for a very long time. Mm. But were there any other people, any resources, that sort of stuff that really helped you propel along? Yeah, I think one of the best investments I've, I've made and I continue to make is being in masterminds or groups. So, for example, um, James is one of the, like James has literally changed my life with both his advice and, you know, his structure and everything like that. Someone else that has literally changed my advice so is a guy by the name of Mitch Harper. Mm -hmm. um, Mitch is the co-founder of Big Commerce. Um, and Big Commerce went public a couple of years ago mm -hmm. uh, during the pandemic. And um, it, it's a really funny story. I'll, I'll segue, but um, we're meant to be having a coaching call with Mitch. And then literally before the coaching call, like day before, he sent me an email and goes, bro, we've just gone public. I can't be bothered. He's a, he's a full <laughs> refund for the last year. <laughs> like, because Big Commerce went public and his net worth just like shot for the roof. And he's just like, Sorry, bro. I can't be bothered. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Like, he's honest. What are you going to do? Like, the business, you know, doing $150 million a year. He's worth, you know, I, I, when it went public, it was like worth close to a billion dollars. I'm like, oh, wow. I, I, I get it. Good on you. I get it. But he's like, um, I think I, I'm i somewhere in between James and Mitch in terms of where I view business and in my worldview and how hard I want to push. So the fact that I had two coaches meant I'll get two sets of advice and I synthesize for me. So Mitch was definitely one of the other. Um, mm. Mitch and my accountant, David Kenny, DK, who I met through the, he ran the program with Mitch. Mm. Um, DK is Mitch's accountant and he's accounting side hobby. He's literally, oh, you guys, you met him. Um, he's like such an entrepreneur, like an amazing, amazing entrepreneur. Um, and accountant's kind of like, just he does it just because. Like that's how he Someone says accounting is my side hustle. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, accounting's literally a side hustle. Like yeah. he's so good at it, but it's a side hustle. He's yeah. real, well, he's the best network guy in Australia by far. Um, so Mitch and um, DK were so formative in terms of how I view business from the other perspective because James is great in terms of, you know, you know looking at the remote stuff, looking at the lifestyle, looking at, you know, health and, and wellness while you build a business. Mm. And Mitch has built like $150 million a year business. So his knowledge set is very different and I want to be somewhere in between. So it was good to have both of them as well. Um, I learn a lot from my clients. So um, um, clients that like they, they came through, that mastermind I was talking about, Grace and Adam Lever, who are really good mates of mine, um, you know, love them to bits, and they've got such a successful business. And every time I talk to them, I just feel like I've just learned so much. Like I, mm. I feel guilty hanging out with them because they've got like we just talk business, and I'm just like, whoa, it's like a KFC think, commercial. Yes, just shut up and take my money, yeah, right? Like, yeah, these guys think yeah. different. Like it's it's you know that's that's been epic. Um, so yeah, those are the people that you know, have had such a massive impact on my life. And like, like almost everyone I come across has one way or another I've, I've learned from. So it's not just like, oh, you know, these are the only guys. Like everyone I come across, whether they're a client of mine or a team member or even someone, you know, they've just had a chat to about the business has had a massive impact. Um, but those people are probably up there in terms of, oh, and, um, uh, and my good friend, at, um, Ads, Ads Jacobs, who runs one of the um, you know, biggest uh, talent agencies, hang out with him and his network has been eye opening. So like, there's just, I think for me, I really value the people around me and um, every single person, like I feel really guilty. There's also a guy called Steven Esketsis who runs Digital Markets Australia, one of my best mates. He was one of the reasons my business turned around the way it did. So Steven Esketsis was one as well. Um, like there's just so, so many people that uh, I feel guilty for mentioning particular names. There's so many that I owe like so much speech, to. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's like, thank you, my mom and my dad. Thank you so much. Like, but literally like I, I'm, I'm so, so lucky to have been put in contact with the people I have been and the people like I'm just some dumb shit like who's just fell in front of like, just put one foot in front of the other. That's it. But everyone around me has been like the guiding where I place my feet. And so everything I've achieved, every success, quote unquote, that I think I've had is a result of directly a result of every person I've named and more. Like 
when I was about to fail, my business was about to go one day. I was about to go back to work. Stephen Esquesis took a chance at me and goes, bro, you're such a good marketer. You just don't talk about yourself enough. Get up on stage. He ran an event. He goes, get up on stage and talk right. about it. From that event, I landed my biggest client at that point. And that one client paid all of my bills. I'm like, shit, I can breathe. I can pay my mortgage. All right. And from that, you know, I can literally, every single one of the people I spoke about, I can trace a point where they've changed my life. And so like, for me, it's like, I feel like I've been so, so lucky, like so lucky in terms of who I've been able to come across. Um, and, you know, if I can give back 10% of the value that everyone's given me, like I'll be over the moon because they've given me so much. So I think that's the one thing that I've been really lucky with. Just who you know. But I also think it's not just luck. It's the fact that you've been really self-aware of who has helped you pivot in certain ways as well. Not a lot mm. of people can pick up on that and take action. Like you said, oh, you, you seek advice and then you yeah. apply it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the like. I really, I'm, I'm so comfortable talking about everything else except myself. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. I think, um, like, I think one thing that makes it easy for me to make friends is that I'm like, I when I go into talking to someone, I get to know someone. I'm like, what can I, what value can I give to to these people? Mm -hmm. And even like most of the people I hang around, you know, they're way more successful than me. Like I'm literally small fry. But it's like, can I give one bit of knowledge that they might not have had? Can I put one connection in front of them that they might not have had before that can help them? And I think the reason why um, I've been able to make such good friends is because like. I don't want to be the selfish one in the party. I want to be the one that brings something to Yeah, your first. intentions are good. Yeah. 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 So like it's on that scale of like give and take. And I think if there's one thing that I think I do well, it's um, naturally just wanting to be more of a giver than a taker. Um, and I think people kind of sense that, I hope. Because um, yeah. yeah. I think one of the things that stuck out for me, I guess seeing you from afar is you are a master networker. Like no doubt about it. I know you won't say that yourself, but- I, I think in my eyes, like if I were to see sort of all out of all the people that I know, you are one of the best networkers. And I think it goes back to you sort of seeking out knowledge, the giving value, all of that sort of stuff that you spoke about as well. But I think it's like, I think more importantly, it's getting outside your comfort zone. So if you talk about like the exposure stuff that you were doing, um, because to go from a guy who's like super like phone phobia to like literally like knowing some like heavy hitters speaking out there stage, is not yeah. easy. Yeah, speaking on stage, like it is, um, you know, it's like people talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. So um, I think if I've learned anything out of this is actually to um, not just, I think people fetishize like ideas and mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. learning and they seek out wisdom, but they do nothing with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I see a lot of like, perfection a lot of trying to get things just done perfectly before they ship it out and i think you're more like definitely action taker don't judge too much just get into the weeds and get it done sometimes you it'll backfire on you like you know you can't pay the bills right <laughs> um but i also think like i take a lot from like even like investing philosophy which is like instead of timing the market you time it's time in the market right <clears throat> and i think for you i think just the sheer six years plus um of just being in the game and doing this consistently you're gonna have your ups and your downs but at the end of it you're still gonna win on the back end right it's just that you're not day trading the sort of the ups mm -hmm. and downs and you're not tapping out and selling out when you know things are not going right or meaning in other words giving up versus you know moving into like taking advantage of things when things are going well as well so i like i respect that because i think um i spend a lot of time in my own head struggling with sort of like when things are not going right i'm like fuck this i don't want to like i don't want to do it anymore and like i think that's the inner asian to me as well where i'm just sort of like all right play it safe let's just go back to like that safety yeah. corner that we're sort of used to so mm -hmm. um it's definitely something that i think if people are listening i think it's like super important that not to overthink and uh, like analysis paralysis like think about mm -hmm. this sort of stuff and actually just take action because it all sort of works out at some stage i don't know if that's the same for you but like somehow things work out things go wrong and then I don't know, all of a sudden you do a few things and magic mm. happens and it works out. Well, I think the um, the biggest analogy I'd, I'd give of that is like I, I train Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He's been training Jiu-Jitsu for like years and years and years. Um, pretty good at it, I would say. Um, but like when you first start, and, and I coach it now, so when I see someone first starting and they're a white belt and it's one of the first sessions, they're, they're like spazzy and they just do like all this stuff they think they should do. Baby giraffe. <laughs> yeah, they giraffe and they're like, and it's like when I, when, when I, when I spar with them and roll with them and they're like 120 kilos, I'm, I'm like, you know, 70 kilos, tapping them out 10 times in like five minutes. And they're just like, what the fuck just happened? Like it's, it's kind of like, like that. But then like, I think 
having gone through the journey and seeing like this is you know it's it's a tangent to, to life right you always start where you just eat shit and everyone is better than you and everything thing you do seems like the wrong move everything seems like it sucks there's nothing that you do feels like it's going the right direction but then like when i look at the jujitsu process it's like cool you're getting tapped every single night but you suck this week. Can you get tapped one less time next week on every single roll? And eventually you make so many mistakes and get punished so many times for it that you know instinctively, oh, if I stick my arm out this way, it's going to hurt. So I'm not going to do it. It's like, can you, like, how quickly can you go through every single mistake you can make right. to the point where you just can't make another mistake because you made it in the past? And it's true with jujitsu and it's true with life and relationships and family and business. Like, how quickly, how much shit can I eat consistently and shortcut <clears throat> the learning process to find success as fast as I can? Mm. And I think I was really lucky in that I got into jujitsu early, so I could almost see the, like, the the, the parallel path of learning jujitsu versus business and life mm-hmm. and things like that. And it's just been like this vehicle that I've learned about life through. Um, so that I think, yeah, one other thing I've been lucky with and just but being able to see the process now that I coach of how people come through, it's like such a life lesson. Teaches you a lot about like discipline, consistency, perseverance. Yeah. yeah. Like pers- it's one of those things where like if I, um, the biggest point when people quit in jiu-jitsu is straight after they get off their white belt into the blue belt because now they're kind of competent and they start to realize how much they don't know. Like when you don't know what you don't know, everything's easy. You reckon you can like smash it out and be world champion or like UFC in two years. But when you start to really dive into it, you're like, holy fuck, I'm actually an idiot. Like I don't know <laughs> anything about this. That's when most of the people quit. Like 90% of people, if they, they persist past blue belt, they'll get to black belt. But at that blue belt level, which when their eyes are open, they're like, whoa, there's a whole world out here I don't know about. If you can get through that point and just get to your purple belt and just focus on the next step, you'll get to black belt one day. And I think that's true of like business, right? Like when I first started, I was knew nothing about business, couldn't talk on the phone, couldn't sell, couldn't market, couldn't do anything. And I just literally every single day, I'd wake up and I get choked out, like tapped out. But I just did enough times where like, I did this last time and it didn't work well. Some <laughs> dude screamed at me on the phone. Let's not do that again. And then you make enough mistakes where you're just like, now you start seeing like, oh, right. Okay. Now I'm a blue belt. Now I start to see where I'm really weak at. And then you've got two choices. Like, do I go deep and get good at this or do I give up now? And so that's, you know, how I've kind of seen the whole journey. Yeah. Wow. You make, you make failure familiar. Like yeah. it's, one just of constantly those things. humble yourself as well. Yeah, but also just like it's a process of elimination. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. Like yeah. It's like there can only be so many. Like yeah. how many times can you, you can fail? Make so many mistakes. Yeah. Like, oh, I mean, like the caveat being, don't be an idiot and never learn from mistakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. like it's funny because in, in jujitsu you can't do that because your arm freaking hurts yeah. when someone arm bars you. So you learn really quickly not to do it. But in life, there's not like there's no physical like tap physical yeah. arm bar or like, you, you know where it's like this is really painful let me learn from it it's just things like if you make a mistake in life chances are nothing happens that's and it's really hard to learn from having no pain or no discomfort um but like so you've got to be more like open-minded and, and have a high perception of what worked and what didn't work and fail and knowing that sometimes not getting a result is a failure and it should be painful. Mm-hmm. But also like, it, you know, it's so hard for everybody because everybody's got different risk tolerance and resilience, um, all that kind of stuff. It's really knowing what works for you, but just being able to mm. trust yourself to go for that journey. Yeah. yeah. You talk about giving Will therapy advice <laughs> six years ago. <laughs> what would you What would you say to Will six years ago? This is corporate Will. It's a really, really hard question to answer. And I'll, I'll tell you why, because... Knowing what I know now, if I had known that six years ago, I wouldn't have gone down the path. Mm. So if I hadn't gone down the path though, I wouldn't have learned what I learned. So if I was sitting there, I would have been like, come on, you just go to you. You just go to you. <laughs> because sometimes you have to go for it. You have to eat shit. You have to see how resilient you are. Like, how do you know where your boundaries are if you've never pushed your boundaries? But if someone tells you pushing your boundaries might mean that you fall off a cliff, you're not going to go near that cliff. Mm-hmm. And it's a bad analogy. <laughs> it, it, but, but who knows? There could be a safety net at the bottom of the cliff. But that's that's the thing. But how do you know unless you push it? But if, you, if you're too scared to push it, you'll never know. So I think if I was sitting down in front of myself six years ago, I'd have been like, look, dude, you never know. Like, just, you know, try it. What's the worst that can happen? What's the worst thing that can happen? 
all the while knowing that actually it's a pretty fucking tough journey, <laughs> yeah. man. Like, like you know, put your big boy on these on because it's going to be like a like a shit fight. You're going to have to get down and scrappy. But I wouldn't actually say that to myself because then I wouldn't even do it. Mm-hmm. Um, for people viewing this, they might be like, "Oh, nah, that's too cheesy, not me." But find the thing that drives you. Like what drives drives you to to do what you do, and you've got to find enjoyment in what you do versus the result. Like, um, if it's just the result, I would have stopped growing about a year ago because mm. I hit all the financial targets mm-hmm. I set for myself. Right, you know, it's last the year, and I was just like, "Fucking king of the world!" Like, <laughs> look at me. But then, like, but because I enjoy the journey so much, because I enjoy the process so much. I've got so much joy in just doing what I do that I don't, at the, at this point, I'm just like, I just want to find a more effective and efficient way of doing what I do rather than like, oh, I want, I need another million dollars. Like the money is like, yeah, cool. We're comfortable. But it's like, I wake up every morning. I'm just like, let's break some shit. Like, like let's have some fun, you know? And that's for me, it's like such a big driver. Like I'll never retire. Like I'll work today. I'll drop down and die, but I love what I do so much. I don't even know if, if it's work for me, mm-hmm. but like, if you're young, you listen to this and you've been sheltered in a little Asian family and your parents have been like, oh, oh, oh Timmy, don't do this. Like, <laughs> like, just try shit because you never know. Like, yeah. I, like, because I tried IT, I knew that I hated IT. Like, it's not what I wanted to do. But then I tried this marketing thing. I'm like, wow, this is really interesting. So, like, I've had so many different things that I've really gone for and obsessed about as I was growing up. Like, I, I thought at one stage I was going to be a professional rugby league player. Didn't work. Don't have the body for it. Then I thought, oh, I'm going to be um, an environmental scientist. Didn't work. Went to my first um, maths class in university and they're like, oh, this is I. It's a imaginary number. I'm like, I don't get real numbers. <laughs> yeah. Imagine what the fuck is this shit? And then like, there's so many different things that I had to try before I found like, oh, I think I'm actually kind of good at this one. And so knowing like your enjoyment versus what you're good at and just being able to flip over to enjoy being good at something rather than enjoy right. that. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it can be, be good at playing video games, but that might not be where you end up in your yeah. career. But you've got to learn to find the thing that you don't mind, but then enjoy being good at that thing. And the enjoyment of being good and chasing your craft and improving yourself is going to get you a lot further than like, you know, financial goals or like, um, like like material goals because that goes through so quickly, and then it's just like a Porsche is the same as a Toyota. Like, yeah, it's not, but uh, <laughs> you no, know I mean, like you get used to that stuff, but you've got to find the thing that gets you up in the morning, gets you excited, gives you fulfillment. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Uh, thanks, yeah. This was fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, obviously, I think to round out, if anyone wants to say either, I don't know, get in touch with you, they want to learn more mm-hmm. about what you do. Where can we find you? Yeah, where can you find um, gr- uh, Find me on growthlabswithaz.com. Um, yeah, Z because I couldn't buy the domain of an X. <laughs> I, just, I just did it and it's, it's worked out well so far. So <laughs> um, that's the company website. So find me on there. Otherwise, um, well, LinkedIn or wherever. Like, We'll yeah. link in the show notes anyway. Yeah, yeah, just chuck a bunch of links in there. All right. Well, I think we'll wrap it up at there. Appreciate yeah. you coming all the way out here. Thanks for listening to the Level Asian podcast. Make sure you subscribe and leave us a five-star review if you enjoyed the episode. And why not share it with friends and family who might enjoy it too? Also, make sure you head over to levelasianpodcast.com to join our email list and to receive the latest updates and get notified when the next episode drops. If you know a great guest we should feature, email us at contact at levelasianpodcast.com or DM us on our socials in the show notes. Catch you on the next episode.